Ladies and gentlemen, it's 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. Welcome to Speaker's Corner. Good to see people here. Good to see people here dressed in very interesting costumes. I'm going to say nothing about that because I know our speaker this morning will. Would you please welcome from Litchfield Canals Trust, Peter Buck. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we don't have any peasants in Litchfield, so I think we're all right. Welcome to hmm? Speaker's Corner. My name, as, as introduced, is Peter Buck, and I'm, today I'm going to talk about the vision of a Litchfield Canal. Cast your mind back to the 1740s and 1750s and what the transport infrastructure looked like then. Transport then was by foot if you were poor, by horse if you had some money, or by horse-drawn carriage if you were a gentry or had a bit of wealth. And for goods, you basically only had carts with a maximum load of about three tonnes drawn by horses along pretty, pretty awful roads or tracks. Unless, of course, you lived near a river or a watercourse, which is the only way to really move bulk goods around the country. Long cross-country journeys for goods, say from the industrial West Midlands, were forced to be transported by cart, sometimes through Litchfield to river wharves at Burton or Gainsborough, and then by boat down the River Trent and if they needed to get down towards London via Hull, down the North Sea to the Thames or the Medway, and then up into London. River traffic was very unreliable, subject to wind, tides, and in the upper reaches, of course, depth of water. Much work had been carried out to improve river, river navigations, and there was great pressure to make further improvements to them. What was happening at that time in the 1740s and 50s England was at war with so many countries. France, I think we still are, aren't we? <laughs> Austria, India, America, Canada, and even the Scots. So the country was fairly desperate for industry to provide materials for, for war items such as guns and cannons. With coal and iron being found in the, in the Midlands, this became an industrial area. But the problems of transportation of goods across the country. At about that time in December 1771, we also had to give a flavor, we had reports of a young slave, Negro slave, 10, 11 years old, being auctioned in Litchfield for an attorney, a lawyer, solicitor from Warsaw. Does that tell you something? <laughs> James Brindley, then about 42 years old, a millwright from Leek in Staffordshire, came into the area. Now that was, he was born about 300 years ago and from his notebooks written at the time he visited and clearly stopped in Litchfield on several occasions. His experienced eye, from high on a horseback riding down the Trent Valley, he would be able to read a landscape to create pounds for mills and he had a vision. His vision was to run a Litchfield canal from Minster Pool behind me, through Stowe Pool and Pones Mill to the navigable river at River Trent at Kings Mill near Castle Donington. Of course, the idea of this canal was to halve the cost of transporting goods from the industrial Midlands to London and the south um, and to get them through to the River Trent and of course also halve the time for these journeys. Brindley surveyed the route for the canal and produced his estimate for the works in 1758 in the sum of 15,940 pounds and thanks to one of my colleagues here we've actually been down to uh, the Bodleian Library in Oxford and we've actually handled that original document it's, it's fabulous to, to see it that's 15,940 pounds for 30 miles of canal Brindley also gave notice in 1759 and uh, to Parliament and I have here the the document and first of December the 1st 1759 it is proposed to apply to Parliament this session for an act making a navigable canal 
from Stowe or Minsterpool in the city of Lichfield into the River Trent near King's Mill in the county of Derby upon the following plan. And it goes on and on and on and on. Brindley was clearly full of ideas, but sadly the burghers of Lichfield and those with wealth and money couldn't get their act together. Not much changed to now, is there? Um, and the, program, the canal was not progressed. Uh, and Brindley diverted his attentions, uh, or had his attentions diverted by the Duke of Bridgewater, who needed access, improved access to his coal mines in, uh, in Manchester. Just imagine if this had been the port of Lichfield, is what would have happened under, under Brindley's vision. If he had succeeded with his backers for the original canal, this would have been port, this would have been highly industrialised, and how, how would it have changed from what we see here today? James, of course, met with uh, the Duke of Bridgewater, and he, had, he was developing much, much grander ideas. And uh, clearly he had an idea for either a grand trunk canal or a grand cross of canals to connect right the way through the, through the country. And he produced drawings for these from an er, as early as 1760. And I have here one of, one of his, the, the title of one of his plans, which I'll read to you. It is a plan of the navigable canals now making with inland parts of this kingdom for opening communication to the ports of London, Bristol, Liverpool and Hull with the adjacent towns and rivers by James Brindley. And there, this is the good bit. To the most noble Marquis Francis, Duke of Bridgewater, Marcus, Marquis of Brackley, and Baron of Elmsmere, this plan is most humbly dedicated to His Grace's most obedient, humble servant, James Brindley. He knew how to grovel, didn't he? <laughs> so, 1766, uh, the Trent and Mersey Canal was finally developed as part of this Grand Cross. The Act of Parliament was passed and one of the key legs of Brindley's canal was, was uh, basically they, they cut the first sods some 250 years ago this year. Um, really good. It's worth noting that he included some 28 miles of the original earlier idea for the Lich, Lichfield Canal but the leg coming into, the Lich, into Lichfield was never included in that. Shame. Around this, this year, 1766, was also fairly momentous, was the, saw the first meeting of our very own Erasmus Darwin and the Lunar Society. The first scientists of a modern age, with people like Darwin, Bolton and Priestley, and really move, moving the country into the modern age. In 1771, behind us would have, of course, missed the opportunity to be part of the canal system. Was, was remodelled by Anna Seward to the serpentine shape we see today with lo later improvements by the Lichfield Improvement Commissioners who acted, applied for and act to improve the bridge on the end, the old British, Bishop Langton's Causeway to a new substantial bridge. 1777 saw the completion and opening of the Trent and Mersey including the Harecastle Tunnel, a fabulous piece of engineering but Brad Brindley sadly did not live, live to see this open. Canal mania struck right across the country, and the country was desperate to see more of these canals that Brindley had started and was involved in. And he constructed canals all across the country. Some of the, some of the canals, including Stainforth and, Stainforth and Keedby, the Droitwich, the Calder and Hebel, the Birmingham. In all of this, he got time to actually go and get married. He also had some time to actually have two children as well. I think we, we, we suspect there might be some other children as well, which, which we don't, won't speak about. He also completed the Les Chesterfield, the Leeds and Liverpool, the Coventry, Thames improvements, the Staffs and Worcester, and the Calden Canal. James Brindley finally died on the 27th of September in 1772. I suspect worn out. But what an amazing legacy, transforming the transport system in this country, probably one key factor in the success of the Industrial Revolution. 
Others picked up on the canal mania and continued to build and improve the canal system well into the 1800s and the start of the railway age. Meanwhile, in sleepy old Litchfield, it was 1794 before the Worley and Essington Canal was extended down from Cats Hill and Ogley near Brown Hills through the south of Litchfield to join the Coventry Canal at Huddlesford. Only three years to construct seven miles of canal. That is a feat of engineering when you consider what, they, what resources they had. But the uh, Worley and Essington was open to canal traffic and wharves for all businesses through the south of Litchfield, with paper coming from Darnford Wharf, coal at St John's Wharf, and various other wharves, stone, grain, manure, lime for fertiliser and for building mortar. Gallows Wharf, behind the Shell Garage, which basically was located for general cargo. And in 1803, a gentleman called Boothby sourced some stainless glass windows from the Herkin Road Abbey in Flanders for our great Litchfield Cathedral behind me. These fine relics were crated and shipped over the hull and we believe they were transferred to barges and shipped up the new canal, now only at that stage six years old, to be offloaded at Gallows Wharf and to be loaded onto carts for the final leg to our fabulous cathedral. These stained glass windows have recently gone under a major restoration refurb and should be visited. Gallows Wharf continued to be used for a great variety of materials, loading and unloading, including cast iron pipes for the upgrade of the ancient water supplies from Aldershaw, the conduit lands elements. And, of course, Gallows Wharf, the name gives a clue, in 1810, 1st of June, saw the execution by hanging of three men, accused and sentenced for forging banknotes. While we were in... Uh, the Bodleian Library, we came across the original notices that uh, were posted at the time. And I shall read you, read you one of those to give you a flavour of what was happening. And this notice was for the execution, life, parentage, education and behaviour of John Neve, William Waitman, <coughs> for uttering forged Bank of England notes. That's forgery to you and me. And James William Jackson, for forging and uttering bills of exchange. And it goes on to say, these truly unfortunate men received sentence of death on Wednesday the 18th of April, 1810. And on Friday morning, the 1st of June, about 10 o'clock, were attended by the sheriff, constables, and other peace officers who conducted them to the place of execution, about a mile from the city of Litchfield at Gallows Wharf when after devoting their last moments to prayer and penitence and making their finer atonements to Almighty God for their transgressions through life, they were launched into eternity before an immense concourse of people who were witness of the most exemplary patient penitence and good behaviour, like you guys actually, becoming men, quitting this life for an eternal one, there to answer for their sins, before an all-merciful God who is wont to give more than either we desire or deserve. The notice expands on the characters of these, these three men. Or oh, unfortunate souls, bless them. Only found out a couple of days, those three men were actually buried in St Michael's churchyard, just up the road. So yes, these little bits and pieces, they all start to come. The Worley and Essington serve worked Litchfield well up to the Second World War, the pressures from rail transport and road transport after the war led to the decline in the commercial use of canals generally, and, and in particular the Worley and Essington, and led to the closure of the Worley and Essington in 1954 with the Acts of Abandonment. Canals for Leisure. Much has been written about the pioneers in the early days, particularly Tom Rolt and his narrowboat Cressy cruising from just before the Second World War. I have some competition. As long as they don't drop anything. The IWA was formed with a meeting of Tom Rolt and Robert Aikman, leading to the formation of the In Inland Waterways Association. Again, this is a good year for anniversaries. 70 years ago, on the 15th of February in 1946, 
and they, they, their goal was to advance the use of canals and river for waterborne trade as a national amenity. The IWA have fought and continue to fight to this day to stop the further closure of canals and for the restoration of derelict canals for the community. The Litchfield and Hatherton, some 30 years ago, saw the formation of the Litchfield, Litchfield and Hatherton Canal Restoration Trust at a boat rally in Pelsall. For those that are interested, there's another one this year in August, so you can go, we, we've got other great things. The Trust founders, of which we have our very own Eric Wood, thank you Eric, he was one of our original founders, set out about restoring the abandoned and derelict Worley and Essington Canal under the new name of the Litchfield Canal, the seven miles from Ogley to Huddlesford, and the Hatherton Canal between the BCN and the South Staffs. South, yes, South, South Staffs and Worcester. Worcester. Battles with bureaucracy. I don't think Brindley ever had the battles with bureaucracy because he had lords and people behind him. Followed, and they continue to this day. The initial battles were with Midland Expressway and the M6 toll. And the government, we even managed to change policy on the government. But fabulous and major achievements were, 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 were achieved. With culverts on the Hatherton at Churchbridge, aqueducts over the M6 toll, the Birmingham Road tun tun tunnel culverts, the Tamworth Road Borocop Canal Park, Darnford Park, more recently HS2 and Capper's Lane rerouting. A bit more battling with bureaucracy there and also protecting the route of the canal and opening the heritage towpath trail for the community to use. This would have not been possible without the help, guidance and support of so many people working behind the scenes. Beavering away as those like David Suchet who supported us for many years and I believe he's actually due to be with us in, in the next fortnight to visit Litchfield and others who lead, led the battle from the front. We also stand on the shoulders of these great men of vision. James Brindley, who had the first vision of a Litchfield Canal. And those men and navvies who toiled to build the original canals across this country. And those, to those who had the vision of canals for leisure for the community. And to the volunteers of the Trust who continue to battle undaunted with the bureaucracy and toil to restore the canal and keep alive the flame of a vision of a Litchfield Canal. I give you the Litchfield Canal. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Anyone wish to join us? Anyone, Anyone wish to ask? My manure, cotton water. You, will, will unload your manure? Manure was a problem. Can you imagine all the manure that was stacked up in Litchfield and stacked up in large towns? Had to go somewhere. Generally, it was much easier to put it on a narrowboat and take it up to somewhere like Muckley Corner. There is, that's not the reason why it's called Muckley Corner, but, but up at Muckley Corner, we, we believe there was a manure wharf, and there are other manure wharfs all the way along the Wernie and Essington Canal. Peter, on behalf of Speaker's Corner, first of all, we would like to thank you for a superb speech. Uh, we learned so much, actually, members of the Speaker's Corner Committee, about the local history, and that's certainly been the case today. You have a superb speaking voice as well, which we're very envious of. So on behalf of the committee, first of all, thank you very much for being here this morning, and I know further thanks are due. Peter, we are most grateful to you for coming along this morning. I know you've done a great deal of research, and uh, you spent a lot of time. You spend hours and hours working for the Litchfield and Hallerton Canal Restoration Trust. Those people who don't know, I'm actually president of the trust and they made me president when I retired as chairman in the year 2000. I went away and I thought, well, I'll leave it for other people now to get on with. But they decided to make me president, so I'm still involved in some way. We're most grateful to you, Peter, for having spoken this morning. It's been a very eloquent speech. And we do think that uh, your work in producing it has been absolutely superb. Thank you ever so much. May I ask you to, to put your hands together and say a very big thank you to Peter for coming along and entertaining us. Thank you, Peter.